Chapter 27, The Cold War. Even though America had emerged from World War II relatively unharmed, you know, compared to the rest of Europe, and in a pretty commanding position in the world, uh, we'll find that we don't have time to enjoy the peace because an even larger conflict with the Soviet Union is beginning to heat up. And as we mentioned last chapter, it really began before World War II was even over. This conflict, known as the Cold War, uh, we will see uh, dominate American life for the next 40 years and lead to at least two armed conflicts. So this is a, a momentous event in American history. So we're, we're going right from the Great Depression into World War II into this new conflict known as the Cold War. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the policy of containment and our actions towards the Soviet Union. We're going to talk about the impact of the Cold War on Asia because it was primarily a European thing but eventually it will spread over into Asia. And then lastly, we'll talk about the effect of the Cold War here in the United States and the rise, or at least continued, anti-communism in America. Okay, let's talk about containment. After World War II, the United States has emerged as one of, if not the leading uh, country in the world. We have a strong military, uh, we have unmatched manufacturing capacity, and we are the only country with the atomic bomb, right? That, that's kind of our ace in the hole. Remember we were talking about maybe that's why Truman used it against Japan to kind of show the Soviets, hey, this is what we're capable of. So after World War II, the United States is the undisputed power, and President Truman, and really before him, FDR, uh, were both determined not to retreat into isolationism again. Uh, isolationism again. Remember, uh, the United States has this very back and forth relationship with the rest of the world. Sometimes we want to be cut off and isolated from the rest of the world, and sometimes we're feeling much more interventionist, and we want to be involved with the rest of the world. Well, Truman and, like I said, FDR before him, they were. Uh, determined not to repeat what happened after World War I. Remember, after World War I, we refused to join the League of Nations. We kind of drew back into our shell, and we saw that the consequence of that, at least partially, was World War II. So Truman was determined not to let that happen. The only problem is, is that now we have a major new rival, and that is going to be the Soviet Union. And we mentioned we had problems with the Soviets even before the war is over uh, because we have two very different ideologies in place. Remember, the United States is in favor of democracy. The Soviets were pushing communism, capitalism, different forms of government, different forms, uh, different economies. So it's just, just very different world views are going to clash in this Cold War. Um, so this wartime alliance that we, and remember we were wartime allies with the Soviet Union, but that was more of a, an enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of deal. Once Hitler was defeated, then our, our own hostilities are, are going to take place. Uh, Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill, the, the leader of wartime Britain, came up with the term Iron Curtain, uh, which referred to the blackout of information coming out of Eastern Europe. And this is a big problem for the United States. We have this tension with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union is in no shape to, to start a third world war, right? The, the Soviet Union has no intention of starting an armed conflict with the United States. That's why it's called a Cold War. The, the reason we call this a Cold War is because there were never any outright hostilities between the United States and the Soviet Union. We never go to war against the Soviet Union. This is not a war that's being fought with tanks and planes and guns, American soldiers against Soviet soldiers. That never really happens. It's a Cold War. It's a war of influence. It's more of a situation where both the United States and the Soviet Union are building up their alliances. So if it ever does break out into a hot war, uh, we will have the people on our side, or they would have the people on their side, necessary to win the war. So that, that, that's what the Cold War is really all about. It's a war of influence, and how can we bring people into our alliance? So if we do have to fight the Soviet Union, 
we would be assured of winning. Well, remember, even though the, the Soviets are in no position to start an armed conflict, at the end of World War II, they have immense influence over Eastern Europe. Remember, it's kind of a race, right? The Americans are moving in from the West, the Soviets are moving in from the East, and as they moved through Eastern Europe, pushing Nazi Germany, you know, uh, back, they left behind little pockets of their army um, and, you know, their, their representatives as they moved through Eastern Europe. So even though the war is over, and even though all these Eastern European countries are technically uh, free and independent, we know that the Soviets have a lot of influence in Eastern Europe. And Winston Churchill says it's like an iron curtain had slammed shut because we didn't know what was going on in Eastern Europe. No information is getting in. No information is getting out. It's a total blackout of information. And so we don't know what the Soviets are up to in Eastern Europe. All we know is that one after another, these Eastern European countries are declaring themselves communist and joining the Soviet Union. We don't know if they're doing this willingly or if the Soviets are forcing them to at the you know, at gunpoint. Uh, we don't know what's going on. So, okay, uh, it, it is a situation, this growing influence of the Soviet Union. There's an American diplomat who's serving in Russia by the name of George Kennan. And George Kennan sends back what's famously known as the Long Telegram. Uh, and this is a telegram from Kennan back to the American government detailing his experiences in Russia. And basically what he says is, you guys have to stop the Russians. You have to stop the Soviets. Now, uh, uh, Russia is not the only country in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has uh, many different countries. Uh, but Russia is the, the dominant one. It's the premier republic. Okay, so anyway, fine. George Kennan sends back this telegram saying that Russia's not going to stop, okay? That is not the mindset of these people. They are going to continue to spread communism throughout Eastern Europe, into Western Europe, into the rest of the world if they can. They're not going to give up. They're not going to be uh, happy with what they've got. They're going to continue to spread this ideology. And so the United States comes up with this policy that will eventually become known as containment. That in order to combat the Soviet Union, we must contain the spread of communism. So literally, we're, we're trying to contain the problem. Now, I, I want you to realize, well, one thing that you need to realize, Truman, as vice president, was never really intended to become president, okay? Uh, even though FDR was in pretty bad health, no president ever picks the vice president saying, well, when I die, this is the guy that I want to have the job. That's not really the way it works. You know, you would think the, the president would be the best guy for the job at, or woman or whatever, uh, and the vice president would be the second best person for the job. Not necessarily the case. And in fact, for much of American history, uh, the vice president was kind of a dead-end job. It was the sort of thing where you've got somebody who's important in the party, and you got to do something with them, but you don't want to give them too much power. So what do you do with them? Well, you either make them an ambassador and send them out of the country, or you make them vice president, where they can't really get up to a lot of trouble. Now, that's kind of changed in recent years, but what I'm getting at here, Truman was never expected to become president. And so when he becomes president, the, he has some deficiencies, and one of those is foreign relations. Uh, he has no foreign policy experience coming into the presidency. And we will see that Truman has very black and white views of the world. You're either with us or you are against us. Um, and that's really what it boiled down to. If you were against communism, you're good with us. If you're for communism, then you are our enemy. And so Truman begins this plan and becomes eventually known as the Truman Doctrine. Uh, th that's part of the containment policy. So the first part of the containment policy is known as the Truman Doctrine, which says we will support free people against subjugation. So if you were fighting a communist revolution, uh, if, there were, um, if you were afraid of a communist revolution in your country, the United States will give you, will give you money, will give you guns, will give you training, whatever needed. You know, we probably won't send you troops, but whatever else we can do, we're going to help you fight the spread of communism. 
And this works. Uh, there are communist revolutions in both Greece and Turkey uh, that the governments are able to put down and contain with the help of the United States. So uh, the Truman Doctrine in that respect was pretty successful. The other part of containment is what's known as the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is a uh, essentially a giant financial loan to Western Europe. Remember, during World War II, uh, Western Europe is devastated. It, it's bombed back to the Stone Age, right? They, they've lost their, their highways, their schools, their hospitals, their factories. And, and so they have to rebuild after World War II. And the Marshall Plan is a giant, at least for the time, I think it was a $12 billion loan that we gave to Western Europe uh, and Japan to help rebuild those countries. And part of this was humanitarian, right? Part of this was that to help out people who didn't have a place to live, people who didn't have food. Part of it was economic reasons. Um, and this is really the, the highlight of the Marshall Plan. We do business with Western Europe. If Western European countries can't afford to buy American-made goods, we're going to, our economy is going to be in trouble. So part of it was kind of self-serving. We gave this loan to Western Europe to get them back on their feet so they could do business with us. And in that respect, the Marshall Plan was a huge success. Uh, that, that $12 billion loan was repaid time after time after time at doing business with the Western European countries. But the other part of it, so there's humanitarian, there's economic, but there's also political reasons behind the Marshall Plan. Uh, a lot of these Western European governments are pro-United States, since, after all, we did help win World War II. Uh, they are pro-United States, but they're also pretty shaky. Um, if your government can't provide the things that people want, if the government can't help people get jobs, if they can't provide food and roads and hospitals and schools, uh, those governments are in danger of being overthrown. And what we were afraid of is that the Soviet Union was going to, to swoop into Western Europe and save the day uh, by, pro by providing finances, by providing food, by providing leadership, that the Soviet Union was going to swoop into uh, Western Europe and overtake them with communist governments. And so part of it was humanitarian, part of it was economic, but part of it was political. Um, if people saw the United States as the ones who were coming in and helping them, they'd be much more likely to be on the side of the United States against the Soviet Union. Okay, it's fine. Those are the two main components of our containment policy, the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan. Also, we realize that, the United States realizes that uh, even though the fighting is over, we can't rest just yet. Uh, we still have to be committed uh, to keeping our military up to date. And part of this is going to be the National Security Act of 1947. Uh, the uh, National Security Act of 47 reshapes U.S. military and diplomatic institutions uh, to, to help America continue to prepare for perhaps an armed conflict. Uh, the big points I want you to realize about the National Security Act of 47, it created a modern Department of Defense. There is no more a Department of War. This is now the Department of Defense. It creates the National Security Council, which is actually a White House agency that helps uh, give recommendations for military and foreign policy, and the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, which of course is America's spy organization. Okay, a major question was what to do with Germany. I think we mentioned in the last chapter, um, the, the Soviets wanted Germany to be split up so it could never, you know, once again rise up and cause perhaps a World War III, whereas the uh, Americans were much more in favor of a keeping Germany unified. Well, Americans wanted a unified Germany, the Soviets wanted a split Germany. To be fair, even our allies, the, the British and the French, they were kind of scared of keeping Germany unified as well. I mean, after all, they had been there on the receiving end of two world wars uh, that Germany was at least blamed for. So in the end, the decision was made to split Germany up. Now, at the end of the war, at the end of World War II, 
all four countries, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, they all had armies stationed in Germany. So the idea was, uh, we'll just keep our armies where they are, and that will be your respective zone. That will be your respective sector. And you can see here, the green area belongs to the British, the blue, the French, the yellow, the Americans, and the red, the Soviets. So that was kind of the idea. Wherever your armies were at the end of the fighting, you know, when the music stops, that chair is yours, right? So at the end of the fighting, where your armies were, that will be your zone of influence. Now, of particular importance, notice in the Soviet zone, that little multicolored blotch there on sort of towards the, uh, the, the right-hand side of it to the east, kind of midway. That little multicolored blotch is going to be the city of Berlin. Remember that we mentioned in the last chapter, chapter before that, that as the Soviets and the Americans are closing in on Nazi Germany, it kind of becomes a race as to who can come to, who can get to Berlin first. Berlin, of course, is the capital of Germany, so it has a symbolic value. Well, if you remember, the Soviets got to Berlin first. Maybe the Americans could have beaten them there, who knows, uh, but the Soviets end up capturing Berlin. And so, the capital city of Berlin is also going to be divided between the French, the British, the Americans, and the Soviets because of its symbolic importance. So even though it is completely surrounded by Soviet territory, it's within the Soviet zone, the city itself is going to be split up. Now this is going to be pretty important um, because what happens is the United States manages to talk the British and the French into combining our three zones into one giant zone. We're going to combine it into one German Republic. And Stalin, who's Joseph Stalin, the leader of Soviet, the Soviet Union, does not like this. Number one, he feels like the rest of the Allies are going back on their word to split up Germany, which uh, I guess they were. And the other thing is, He's afraid that the British and the French and the Americans are all going to team up against him and take the Soviet zone away from him. So he feels threatened. But again, the Soviets are in no position to, to start World War III. Nobody wants to, to see an armed conflict come out of this. But Stalin feels like he has to do something to challenge the British and the French and the Americans. Well, this is where Berlin comes into play. Joseph Stalin decides to blockade West Berlin. Um, but essentially what he does is he cuts all train, uh, he cuts all highway, uh, he cuts all uh, you know, barge ship traffic into West Berlin. He puts up giant blockades, right? And any time a, a truck attempts to enter Berlin, it's turned away. Uh, he cuts off electricity from West Berlin. He cuts off their water. Uh, because all of those services are located in the Soviet zone, so he's, he shuts them off. So the United States has a, uh, has a problem on its hands. The idea of what Stalin is trying to do, he's trying to starve them out, right? The idea is if you cut off Berlin from the, the Germans and the Americans and the French, eventually he will starve them out. They will be forced to accept Soviet rule and Berlin will become a completely Soviet-controlled city. That's the idea. That's what he's trying to do. And so here's Truman, and he doesn't want to go to war. Number one, Americans don't have the troops to go to war. Um, I've read numbers on this before. I want to say that the Americans had maybe, maybe half a million troops left in the army at this point, and the Soviets had, I think, one and a half million. So there's no way that we can put up a military response to this, even if we wanted to. Uh, but he doesn't even want to give that indication. He doesn't want to try to physically force their way through these blockades to, to get to Berlin. But they've got to do something. Berlin only has enough food stockpile for a month. Uh, so after this month is over, they're going to have to do something or the people of Berlin are going to, to starve, right? So they decide on an airlift. And now this is important because, number one, uh, cargo planes have no military importance. And so, you know, it, it's one thing 
that if you try to force your way through these blockades with tanks, right, that, that could be seen as, a, as an aggressive action or as, you know, uh, starting a war. But flying in a cargo plane, that, that, there's no physical altercation there at all. And so the Soviets have to make a decision themselves. They will either have to allow these cargo planes to land, or they will have to shoot down defenseless unarmed aircraft out of the sky. So uh, Truman thinks that this is the, the best course of action to start an airlift, to airlift the supplies needed into West Berlin. Now, you have to understand that the, the technology of the day, they don't have giant super cargo jets, right? They're, they're still running on prop planes here. The airlifting capacity is nowhere near what it needs to be. Uh, people figure out that in order to keep West Berlin alive, they will have to fly in 5,000 tons of food and fuel a day. 5,000 tons of food and fuel per day in order to keep West Berlin alive. At the beginning of the airlift, they figure they have enough capacity to maybe lift in 500 tons. So that they have a huge obstacle, a, a logistical planning obstacle ahead of them. And, and that's another reason that Stalin doesn't challenge this is because he thinks there's no way that this is going to succeed. And so they're thinking, we just got to get through the first couple, maybe three weeks, and after that, Stalin will realize it's futile and he'll give up. So the idea is, if we can just get through the first couple of three weeks, we'll be okay. Hmm. Well, uh, I won't go into it. It's a pretty fascinating story. I won't go into it now. But by the time they were done, they had this down to a science. They had a plane landing every 30 seconds in West Berlin, and they could unload these planes that carried maybe anywhere from 5 to 10 tons of food and fuel. They could unload these planes in 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, they, they had it down to a clockwork science. This lasted 24-7, every day of the week, non-stop. They, they planned for doing this for two to three weeks. It lasted 10 months. And by the time that we got to nearly a year into this, like I said, it was it was like clockwork. It was a science. And the Soviets realized that we could do this as long as we needed to. That we had gotten this down so pat that we could do this without even thinking anymore. And so after 10 months, the blockade is finally lifted. And Germany becomes two separate nations. Uh, the Federal Republic in the West uh, and the Democratic Republic in the East. Okay, fine. And they will remain two separate nations uh, until the, the fall of the Soviet Union in the 19, uh, early 1990s. But this conflict showed how unprepared America was. If we did have to fight an armed conflict, what would happen? You know, is America going to try and sit it out like we, we tried to with World War I and we tried to with World War II? Or are we going to be involved? Are we willing to fight this conflict? Well, what's everybody going to do if we do have to fight this conflict? So out of this comes the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, this is a military alliance. It's created in 1949. Originally it had 12 member countries, but it's, it's grown since then. It's still in effect today. And the, the thing with NATO is an attack on one was regarded as an attack on all. So let's say that uh, West Germany is invaded. You know, the United States and Great Britain and France are not going to sit back and say, well, that's a West Germany problem. That has nothing to do with us. Uh, we are going to be obligated to come to the aid of, of whoever it is. If one member is attacked, it's an attack on all. So it's a military alliance designed, you know, what happens if there's another armed conflict. And the Soviet Union has its own version of this, the Warsaw Pact, um, which was between the uh, Soviet Union and the Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe. Okay, fine. So it's, it's the NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. As it turns out, 1949 is not going to be a good year for the United States. The first thing that happens is that the Soviets detonate their own atomic bomb. 
this is a big problem. Remember, prior to this, we were the only atomic power. It was kind of our ace up our sleeves. Um, and, and we knew the Soviets were trying to design their own atomic bomb. E even the, the Nazis had been researching their own atomic bomb. Now, there's a scary thought, right? Uh, but we had it first. And we thought the Soviets were years and years away from being able to successfully detonate an atomic bomb. So the fact that they were able to do so in 1949 really scares us. And it makes us think, how were they able to jump ahead so quickly? And a lot of people begin wondering if maybe they did not have help. Uh, were they stealing atomic secrets from the United States? And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But the other major problem was with China. I mentioned in the last chapter, China is fighting a communist war. We have the government supported, uh, excuse me, we have the United States supported government of Chiang Kai-shek, who was our ally during World War II, uh, but not a very nice guy. And he's fighting against the communist forces of Mao Zedong. Well, uh, the Chinese Civil War comes to a conclusion and the U.S. supported government loses. Uh, Mao Zedong wins and mainland China becomes communist and of course is still communist today. What happened to Chiang Kai-shek, he and his supporters fled to a nearby island by the name of Formosa. Uh, they fled to Formosa, they renamed the island Taiwan, and they declared that we are the rightful government. That you have mainland China, who's got at this point, you know, nearing a billion people and they're communist. And then you have the little tiny island of uh, Taiwan with, with, I don't know how many people's on it, less than a million people though, I think, um, who claim to be the rightful government of China. And so the United States has a choice. Do we recognize communist China as the rightful government? Or do we recognize Taiwan as the rightful government? Well, for years and years, we said that Taiwan was the rightful government, the government in exile, right? Okay. So 1949 is not a good year for the United States. The Soviets detonate their atomic bomb, and our supported government in China has fallen. In response to this, the... Uh, National Security Council uh, issues a, a new policy. Truman wants a review of American foreign policy and the National Security Council issues a report that becomes known as NSC National Security Council, NSC 68. This is important. This is huge. You need to understand the uh, enormity of, of what's about to happen here because NSC 68 says two things. Number one, it says America must have firm leadership over the non-communist world. The war on communism is too important to leave up to our allies because if we if we let them try to do it alone like we did in China, uh, they could very well lose. So the war on communism is too important to leave up to our allies. We must be in charge at all times. That's the first thing. The second thing is Communism must be challenged everywhere it occurs, even if that location isn't that important to the United States. Even if communism is uh, occurring in an area where we don't have a vested interest, it doesn't really matter to us, we still have to challenge communism because otherwise it's going to be a domino effect, right? Starts in one small place, spreads to a slightly larger place spreads to a slightly larger place, and then all of a sudden half the world is communist. So those are the two things that NSC 68 said. America must have firm leadership over the non-communist world. And number two, America must challenge communism anywhere it is occurring. And that is what directly leads us into the Korean War. This is the first hot engagement of the Cold War. It's the first time that tanks and guns and planes are actually going to be used in this fight over communism. It's kind of the same deal as happened with Germany. At the end of 1945, both the United States and the Soviet Union had armies in Korea. Korea was conquered by Japan, uh, and so as the, the war wound down and we drove the Japanese out, both the Soviets and the Americans have armies in place on the Korean Peninsula. 
And so when the war ended, they essentially decided to divide the, the Korean nation along the 38th parallel. And you can see there the dividing line between North Korea and South Korea. And the plans were to eventually reunite the two countries. Well, uh, the Soviets left in 1949, leaving behind a very strong army. Uh, the Americans also left in 49, and they left only a, a small military force, and so you can kind of see where this is going. In 1950, North Korea is going to invade South Korea, June 27, 1950, the start of the Korean War. Well, immediately Truman goes to the United Nations because that's the point of the United Nations, right? The, the point of the United Nations is to prevent armed conflict uh, around the world. So the United Nations authorizes action, and so the United States sends in military forces. And, you know, they, they call it a coalition, but everyone knows that the United States is in charge. Uh, you know, it's, it's a UN-led coalition, but everybody knows the United States is providing the, the bulk of the firepower and we're in charge. Uh, the, the leader for this little uh, venture is going to be Douglas MacArthur, who I just realized I misspelled his name. It should be M-A-C-A-R-T-H-U-R. But anyway, Douglas and MacArthur, the, the hero of World War II, he was the uh, American commander in the Pacific. Uh, he had been in charge of rebuilding uh, Japan after the, the war is over. So he's he is a uh, he is a great military commander and he is a, an American wartime hero. And the American forces do very well. Uh, initially, the, the South Koreans are getting beat pretty badly, but once the American forces arrive, we are able to push the North Koreans back. And in fact, we pushed the North Koreans back so far they're almost in China. And this actually is going to make China pretty nervous because China is a newly made communist country. And China fears that the United States would use this war as an excuse to invade, you know, communist China. And so communist China is actually going to begin sending reinforcements to North Korea. And once China enters into the war, uh, that they're going to begin pushing back the South Koreans and Americans. And so it becomes kind of a stalemate. Now, Douglas MacArthur was, was livid when China began sending in troops. And as a result of that, he did want to invade China. As a matter of fact, uh, he wanted to use atomic weapons against China. Truman, however, uh, was not okay with this. Truman did not want to start an atomic war with China. Eventually, MacArthur is going to be fired over this. He wouldn't shut up about it. Uh, and so, when you are the, the leading, when you're the commander of the army, uh, or at least the, the commander of the war, he was in the navy. Um, when you're the, the the commander in charge, and you very publicly go against what your president is saying, that's you're going to lose your job. Uh, so, okay, MacArthur is going to be dismissed. And the end result is a stalemate between North and South Korea, and it still exists to this day. Uh, technically speaking, they are at war. They never signed a peace treaty ending the Korean War. Um, and, and that's why every so often you will see there's little flare-ups between North and South Korea. Somebody will, there's this space of land known as the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. It's the no man's land between North and South Korea. And something will happen, of course, we know that North Korea is developing, um, that we, we're pretty, we know they have nuclear weapons. They're trying to develop missiles to deliver those nuclear weapons. Um, somebody will shoot over the border. They'll fire rockets at one another, whatever. Every so often, it still kind of flares up, and the world's kind of watching uh, to, to see when the, North, when the Korean War is going to, to become, you know, uh, re-engulfed when it's going to break out again. It hasn't happened in, you know, 40 years, but 50 years, it, it could always come back. And if it does, we are obligated to come to the aid of South Korea. Uh, we, we have military, we have American military people stationed in South Korea. We have thousands of American uh, military stationed in South Korea on the off chance if North Korea does invade we will be there to help South Korea. So we, we still have a vested interest 
in what happens in Korea. Now, um, so the, the Korean War was a much smaller affair than either World War, obviously. Um, the Office of Defense Mobilization was an attempt by the government. Uh, you know, it, it's like the War Industries Board or the War Production Board, yeah. Um, but on a much smaller scale than what we see, of course, in World War One or Two. But the thing about it is, people begin asking themselves, why can't we win this war? I mean, this in America, right? You know, we won World War One. We won World War Two, even though. Okay, fine. Um, Americans love to say we won both world wars, and that's true because we did. But remember, we kind of came in on the tail end of World War One. And we had a while we had a much more substantial uh, contribution to World War II. I, I want you to know that in Europe, at least, it was the Soviet Union. Um, they, I, I cannot even begin to describe the, the effort and, and the hardship that the Soviet people went through to defeat Nazi Germany. Um, we we suffered in World War II. Don't get me wrong. The Soviets lost millions of people, including who knows how many uh, civilians. You know, we we were attacked on Pearl Harbor. We lost a couple of thousand people, and that was horrible. The Soviets lost a couple million people. So uh, just keep that in mind. Anyway, okay, fine. The, the, the question is, if you know the the big bad United States, the undisputed world power, um, won World War One and World War Two, why can't we win this thing with Korea? I mean, this is a this is essentially a small border skirmish compared to World War I and II. Why can't we get this thing won? And people begin to wonder about, you know, is it sabotage? It, are there people or groups working within the United States to hamper our efforts against the Soviet Union? You know, do we have internal communist threats? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. All right. There are a number of Cold War critics here in the United States. Uh, not everyone shares Truman's black or white view of the world. Not everything is a, not every single challenge is part of the contest with the Soviet Union. And to be fair, we support some pretty bad people uh, in uh, in our contest against the Soviet Union. Because remember, Truman didn't care what else you did. If you were against communism, you were our friend. If you were for communism, you were our enemy. And that led to the United States government supporting some pretty bad people because we didn't care about your human rights record. We didn't care about how you came into power. Were you elected democratically or did you take power through a, a military coup? We didn't care any about that. All we cared about was how you viewed communism. And so, like I said, some pretty bad people, some, some tyrants, some dictators, People who treated their citizens horribly all got support from the United States just because they were willing to fight against the Soviet Union. Now, this doesn't happen under Truman, but a good example of this is Afghanistan. At one point in time, Afghanistan was fighting against the Soviet Union, and since they were fighting against the Soviets, we helped out the, the Afghans. Uh, we gave them military training. We, we gave them uh, weapons. And, of course, uh, you know, a couple of decades later, a lot of that training and weapons are going to be used against us when we invade Afghanistan. So anyway, uh, I just want we support some pretty bad people. The other part is is that we're also willing to support imperialism. Our two biggest allies, the the British and the French, both still have imperial colonies. They they have colonies scattered throughout the world, and so here's the United States, the the champion for self determination and the, the champion of the democratic process and you know we, we fought our revolutionary war against Britain to gain our independence and now here we are supporting people who are keeping their colonies, colonies that want their independence and the British and the French are saying no you can't have it and the United States is supporting that and so yeah there are um, a lot of critics on, on how this Cold War is being handled. The Cold War also becomes an ideological struggle um, in, a, in an effort to win as many allies as possible, uh, America is trying to put its best face forwards, and sometimes we kind of gloss over the bad parts of our history. And American history has some negatives, right? Our, our race relations, our treatment of Native Americans, right? There are some uh, 
pretty, pretty bleak moments in American history. But we don't talk about that to the rest of the world. We talk about our love of democracy and we talk about our efficient economy and we, we talk about all the freedoms that we want to give to the world. Um, but there's, there's some glossing over that goes on. There's some whitewashing that goes over. Um, there's secret funding of publicity tours that the CIA uh, goes around and supports people who are pro-America. So if you're a pro-American artist or a pro-American author, you, you might get secret CIA funding to spread American propaganda around the world. And, and so what I'm getting at, all, all this taken together becomes what's known as a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is one where someone cannot win without someone losing. And that's how it was painted uh, to American citizens. That in order for America to win, we have to beat the Soviets. And if the Soviets win, that means we are losing. Okay? And so it becomes polarized. It's either one or the other. You can't have both democracy and socialism and capitalism all together you can't have a, a mixture of everything. It has to be one or the other. One is good and one is bad. One is, one is, uh, one is evil and one is noble, right? Um, and so even today, people have, I think, a, a knee-jerk reaction. Anytime you say socialism, people are automatically, that's bad. That, that's horrible. <laughs> well, we live in a socialist world. Um, Social Security, you know, the, the sacred cow that no one is willing to touch. Uh, Social Security is a socialist program. It's a wealth redistribution program. It is. Um, it, but back in the day, nobody's willing to say that. Nobody's talking about that. It's all painted as, if we're going to win, we must defeat them. We can't coexist peacefully. If we're going to survive, they have to lose. We have to wipe them out. And it's kind of funny because... Not all socialism is bad. And what I mean by that is, and a good example of this is, the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, uh, what happens is, the United Nations passes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. It's this, um, basically it's saying, we, we think that certain rights belong to everyone. And the way that you treat your citizens uh, can be evaluated by other nations. And I think most American citizens would agree with that. I mean, certain rights belong to everyone. That, that's the idea of natural rights that's enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and within our Constitution. I think we would agree with that. And we're constantly judging other countries on how they treat their people, right? So, okay, fine. I, I think most people would, would get behind this idea. But the funny thing is, both the United States and the Soviet Union use this Universal Declaration of Human Rights as propaganda um, because the United States can point to some things and say we're doing that and that's why we're better and the Soviet Union pointed to it and say we're using we're doing some things on this and that's why we're better so I'm not saying the Soviet Union was a wonderful place to live obviously it was not Joseph Stalin was a psychopath he murdered millions of his fellow countrymen in political purges in disastrous economic failings, millions of people starved to death in the Soviet Union because their farms couldn't produce enough food. Okay, I'm not trying, trying to say uh, that, that I'm a communist and the Soviet uh, Union was this, was this paradise, because I'm not, and it wasn't. But what I'm saying is, people today have this knee-jerk reaction to anything labeled as socialist, and I think it goes all the way back to this point where... Um, it was painted as you're either with us or you're against us, black and white, zero sum, you're either one or the other, and there's no there's no in between. Now I'm trying to, to say that that was not the case. Even back then it was painted like that, but even back then that was not the case. Okay, fine, let's move on. Let's talk about the effects of the Cold War here in the United States. Um, life after World War II it's kind of difficult for America. For one thing, the, the war is over way earlier than anyone had expected. Remember, the atomic bomb, uh, this was secret. Nobody knew this was coming. Everyone was preparing to invade Japan, and we're thinking that's going to be a long, drawn-out, bloody struggle. We're thinking we've still got months, if not years, of wartime ahead of us. 
Well, all and the war is essentially over <laughs> overnight without anybody realizing it was coming. And, and the big fear is that the Great Depression is going to come back, right? Because World War II ends the Great Depression. All the money that the government was pumping into the economy, buying these tanks and planes and guns and bullets and uniforms and whatever, all that 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 faucet has been turned off. The the government no longer needs these things. We're no longer at war. We no longer need these things. And so a lot of that government spending is going to dry up, and a lot of people are afraid the Great Depression is going to come back. Well, that doesn't happen, mostly because of consumer spending. Uh, because remember, for years and years and years and years, people have been rationed. You can't just go out and buy what you want. Uh, you are strictly limited in what's available. So now, all of a sudden, you can go out and buy a new car. You can go out and buy a radio or a new TV set. Uh, you can go out and build a house or, or you know, whatever. So while government spending dries up, consumer spending does pick up. Uh, something that I want you to know about is the newly created GI Bill of Rights. Uh, the GI Bill of Rights provides things like down payments for homes, um, educational loans for returning servicemen to help ease them back into civilian life. And of course, the GI Bill of Rights is still a big thing even today. So I want you to know that that starts after uh, World War II. Now, we do have problems with inflation because of consumer spending. Uh, there's a lot of money flowing in the economy. The economy's running red hot, and as we mentioned last time, or maybe the time before that, uh, if your economy is growing too quickly and there's too much money in circulation, that can lead to inflation and money begins to lose its value. Uh, so we do have problems with inflation, and we do have problems with labor. Um, number one, government protection for a lot of these unions are, is going to end. Remember that the government pressured big business into giving uh, good conditions to workers because if the workers go on strike, the factories shut down and we don't have the tanks and guns and planes and uniforms needed to fight the war. So the government pressured big business, the factory owners, into doing what the workers wanted. Okay, fine, they were willing to do that because they were making lots of money off the war. But now that the war is over, the government protections have ended. And so things are kind of swinging in the other direction. We see strikes and coal and railroad. Uh, we see returning white males as the, the servicemen return home. Uh, they're pushing minorities out of their jobs. Uh, so women are expected to exit the workplace. And some of the women go willingly because they figure they did their part. Now they want to go back to their former lives, and that's fine. Uh, but a lot of women don't want to give up the gains they made in the workplace. Uh, racial minorities, African Americans are pushed out, um, and so that, that creates a lot of tension in the American economy. Now, I want you to know that uh, Truman's domestic policies, uh, this of course is Harry S. Truman, yeah, interesting, the S didn't stand for anything, it's just an initial, um, it's just Harry S. Truman, it, there was, he has no middle name, it's just the, the letter S, okay, anyway, fine. Um, Harry S. Truman's domestic policy is very similar, as you might expect, to FDR's policy. Very liberal. He calls his the fair deal, whereas FDR had the new deal. Truman calls his plan the fair deal. Uh, he wanted to expand Social Security. He wants to raise the minimum wage. He wants to uh, increase federal spending to guarantee full employment for American workers. These, these very liberal programs, these very liberal reforms uh, that, that continue the ideas of FDR's policies. But Truman, however, is not going to get his passed because whereas FDR had a democratically controlled Congress that was willing to go along with his plans, Truman is dealing with a very conservative Congress. Uh, Republicans are back in power and they control Congress and they're not going to go along with what he wants. In fact, they do the exact opposite. They end more New Deal programs. They deregulate the economy. Remember, part of the New Deal was a lot of these government watchdogs uh, to prevent the economy from getting you know, into another Great Depression. Well, he gets rid of a lot of that regulation. They get rid of that, a lot of that regulation. And the Taft-Hartley Act essentially declares war on unions in the United States. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, we also begin to see the rise of civil rights in the United States.
And this is really the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. So th this is what I'm getting at. This is where all this is going. Here's Truman, who is a Democratic president with a Republican-controlled Congress. Truman has very liberal ideas that he wants to get passed, and he's unable to do so. Uh, Truman is very supportive of civil rights, and as a matter of fact, uh, as we near the election of 1948, Truman is going to call for a very ambitious civil rights program. He won't get it passed, but it helps set the stage for the election of 1948. So here's Truman. He's the sitting president. He wants to run for re-election. And his platform, like I said, is very liberal. Expanding Social Security, raising the minimum wage, including civil rights. Very liberal program for the Democrats. Very liberal program for Truman. And his problem is a lot of the conservative Southern Democrats don't like that. Now these Democrats, and again, we're, we're, we're heading towards a, a day of reckoning with the Democratic Party. Because a lot of people, the South was still solidly Democratic. They call themselves Democrats, but in reality, they are very conservative people. And so there's a definite split within the Democratic Party. You have the, the more northern and western Democrats who are more liberal-minded, and then you have the conservative Democrats who are much more conservative. Excuse me, the southern Democrats who are much more conservative. So... Southern Democrats get wind of Truman's very liberal programs, and they don't like it. As a matter of fact, they get up and walk out of the National Convention, and they go form their own party. They say, we don't like what the National Democratic Party is doing, so we're going to form our own party. We're going to call it the state's rights Democratic Party, and we're going to have our own candidate for president, this guy right here, Strom Thurmond. Uh, the, the state's rights Democratic Party, better known as the Dixiecrats, uh, because they were only Southern Democrats, conservative Southern Democrats. Okay. And then we have the Republican. And the Republican candidate for president, a man by the name of Thomas Dewey. And so you can see where we're kind of going to this. A lot of people expected the Republican to win, because we've seen this before, right? When you have an internal split in a party, like we had with the uh, the Bull Moose Party back with Teddy Roosevelt. Some Republicans voted for Roosevelt. Some Repo Republicans voted for Taft. All the Democrats voted for Woodrow Wilson, and he became president. A lot of people think that's going to happen. A lot of people expect some Democrats to vote for Truman, some Democrats to vote for Thurman, all the Republicans to vote for Dewey, and that he's going to win. And here we have... Uh, Harry S. Truman holding a newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, and you can see there the screaming headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, which is what everyone expected to happen. But you can see here Truman's laughing <laughs> because he won. Truman won in a landslide. It, he won an overwhelming re-election. Um, but everybody expected Dewey to win, and in fact, the newspaper already had uh, the next day's copies printed up. They were so sure that Dewey was going to win, they went ahead and printed up the next day's paper in advance. Uh, so here's Truman laughing about it, even though he won. Okay, fine. As it turns out, uh, most Democrats did not vote for Strom Thurmond. Uh, the Dixiecrats won the Deep South, but that's about it. But it does foreshadow what's going to happen. And, of course, if you keep up with politics at all today, you know that the South belongs to the Republican Party. Because, finally, the, the, the very conservative Southern Democrats, their views might not have changed all that much, but they realized the Republican Party was much more aligned with what they were thinking because the Republican Party was conservative. So, okay, anyway, fine. Uh, Truman wins an overwhelming re-election. However, uh, there is no return to normalcy. Remember, that was the campaign after World War I. There is no return to normalcy after World War II. Uh, the Cold War is going to dominate almost all facets, uh, facets of American life. And anyone, again, Communism, socialism, these are bad words in the United States. And anyone linked to communism is going to be the enemy. So, obviously, if you were, say, a member of the American Communist Party, which it does exist, 
um, if you were a member of the American Communist Party, um, obviously you would be looked at as an enemy. But even if you subscribe to a certain newspaper with left-leaning tendencies, if you subscribe to a newspaper uh, labeled as socialist, uh, you could be viewed suspiciously. If you were a recent immigrant from an Eastern European country uh, that has socialist leanings, you could be viewed suspiciously. So it, it's not, you know, it, it would be one thing to to say I'm a member, I am a communist. It's another thing to attend a meeting at someone's house, and just because you're friends with someone who might be a communist, you're also viewed suspiciously. So things are getting pretty paranoid in the United States. And Congress is going to get on and on this as well. Uh, they're actually going to form a special subcommittee, the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, to investigate claims that Truman's Democratic administration is harboring communists. Uh, the, the fear is that communists have invaded the American government and they're working to sabotage it from within. And so the House Un-American Activities Committee, headed up by one Richard Nixon, um, is going... To, to root out these communists. And there is some evidence of this. For example, Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss, uh, at the time, was a former very high-ranking state official. And as it turns out, he was a spy for the Soviets. And he had, for years, uh, conducted espionage on behalf of the Russians. And this was a pretty big blow <laughs> to the American government that one of your highest ranking officials actually turned out to be a Soviet spy, the so-called Hollywood 10. Uh, the, the argument was made that communists and socialists had invaded Hollywood and they were poisoning America's minds through movies. And so people were, were, you were it was known as the blacklist. If you were uh, on the blacklist, you couldn't get a job in Hollywood. And, and so Truman feels pressured to show that he can be tough on communists. So he begins what he calls his loyalty campaign, but essentially what it is is a witch hunt. Uh, we have the case of the Rosenbergs, the uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were an American couple. Julius Rosenberg was a scientist that worked on the atomic bomb project. Um, and he was investigated and he was convicted of passing uh, classified atomic material onto the Soviets. Remember that <clears throat> the Soviets were able to uh, detonate an atomic bomb much earlier than expected. People suspected they had help in building their bomb, and this seemed to fit the bill perfectly. So Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were investigated, uh, charged with espionage. They were tried and convicted and executed. <clears throat> Come to find out, years and years and years later, that the material that Julius Rosenberg passed to the Soviets was almost assuredly uh, useless. It was stuff they already knew, and that Ethel Rosenberg might not have had any idea that her husband was doing this. Um, and so it, it shows that you know America is in a state of near hysteria. We see communists lurking in every shadow and around every corner, and we're, we're deathly afraid of what's going to happen. And this the situation of near hysteria is going to allow for the rise of Joseph McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy is a senator from Wisconsin uh, who claims to have a list of all communist agents operating within the United States. Um, and he is given power over a congressional committee to investigate these workers and uh, root out the communists who are sabotaging the United States. McCarthy never had any list, okay? He had no idea what he was doing. But this subcommittee, all it took was for you to be called in front of it and you, you were stained for the rest of your life. People lost jobs, careers were destroyed, lives were ruined. Um, through his actions. And it wasn't until uh, people finally stood up uh, against him. Um, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Good Night and Good Luck, it's the story of Edward R. Murrow, an American newscaster and journalist, who finally stood up against McCarthy and said, you have no list. All you're doing is running on suspicion, and all you're doing is ruining people's lives. And even today, McCarthyism 
is a byword for you know a government sanctioned witch hunt. Um, but people went along with this, and McCarthy had fans all across the United States because here's you know here's McCarthy's fighting the good fight, he's going after the communists, and people people bought into this because they're so afraid um, of what's going on. This this you know wave of paranoia, this wave of uh, rabid anti-communism has gripped the United States, and, and so. You know, communism ha has has had a back and forth relationship within the United States. At some points, socialism was a very respected ideology within the United States. Um, you know, back during the the Progressive Era, as we move into the Great Depression, you know, it's kind of been back and forth. From the 1950s onward, it's it's all been bad, rabid anti-communism, and eventually it does turn political. Uh, we change immigration quotas from countries that we suspect harbor radicalist tendencies. Uh, people are deported because they are suspected communists. Further dismantling of the, the New Deal programs. And we see this will hit labor and civil rights groups especially hard because a lot of their leaders are socialists. Um, so, okay. And we'll get into this in the next couple of chapters, but as we enter into the 1950s and the 1960s to a lesser degree, you know, on the one hand, we're, we're entering into that, that golden age of Americana, you know, the, the leave it to beaver days of the United States, where everything was, everything was perfect and everything was cookie cutter and, and everybody wants to go back to those good old days, right? You know, the, the Mayberry days, right? Um, and from the outside looking, you know, from the outside looking in, that, that might have been the case, that America looked perfect, <clears throat> we're a world leader, great economy, everything's booming. But underneath, as we move into this, the 60s and 70s for sure, there's this, this turmoil within the United States, rabid anti-communism, the rise of the civil rights movement. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of tension in the United States that we're going to have to exercise as we move through the next couple of decades. But anyway... That is a topic for another day.